Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thanks very much for being here for um, the sort of questions we're asking in today's session about what is a web archive. This is the first talk on the first day of the uh, UK's first national festival of the humanities uh, being human. So thanks very much for being here. Um, just to give you a bit of background on the festival uh, today, it's being led by the School of Advanced Study at the University of London in partnership with the AHRC. And uh, all the events taking place today have been uh, coordinated by uh, that school, and they really explore what it means to be human in an age of having too much information, which we're going to look at ourselves in a bit. Um, don't forget to uh, follow the festival on Twitter, at BeingHumanFest, and tweet during the, using the hashtag that was on the screen. It's now on hashtag BeingHuman14 is your, um, is your way to tweet. Uh, and most of all, please don't forget to fill in the feedback form to tell us what you thought. And there'll be uh, some roving reporters conducting box pop interviews around the event, so please do feel free to uh, pass on to them what you think about the today's event as well. But we're going to get started now by looking at what is a web archive and really ultimately um, who does the web think you are. There's a huge amount of information about all of us potentially, at least most of us, online. And we're going to try and look through some of the um, technical but also the social impacts of that on, on society. Uh, today. But first of all, we've got this quite brief um, but quite sort of colourful and entertaining uh, video explaining to you some of the basis of what a web, uh, web archive actually is. Over the past couple of decades, much of our lives has moved online. What used to be kept in ring binders or photo albums, we now keep on our computers, on our phones, or in the cloud. Many of us look online for news, council services, Synthetics for most of our yeah. information about the modern world. Historians of Victorian England look in archives, like the National Archives at Kew, to find information about their period. Where will historians of our times look? There are traditional archives, of course, but researchers will need to see what was online as well as what was on paper. To make sure that large parts of the web are not lost forever, we need web archives. A web archive contains copies of pages from the live web with information about them and a record of the date at which they were archived. Libraries and archives, such as the National Archives and the British Library, have been busy collecting this online information. A major web archive of the UK since 1996 is kept at the British Library. It's available now to anyone who wants to research our recent past. What can you find there? Just as the web has changed over the past 20 years, so has the archive's content. At first, just the home pages and upper levels of sites were saved, and then only infrequently. But over time, the archive has gone deeper and deeper to capture more information more often. Today, important, fast-changing sites like BBC News are archived much more often than sites that rarely change. Web archives do not and cannot capture everything. There is nothing private here, no internet, and of course, no email. Little social media, no games or apps. Nothing that appears to be from outside the UK, so no Facebook.com or Twitter.com. But even with these caveats, there is still a huge amount there, terabytes of data, trillions of words, millions of memories. Come and see for yourself. And we'll be giving some more details about how you can come and see yourself um, just across the way and across the hallway uh, later this afternoon, but we'll come to that at the end. Um, so I think hopefully that video has shown you that web archives are uh, really exciting, but also potentially quite challenging uh, resource for use uh, in telling us about our past. Um, I realise I forgot to introduce myself earlier. My name is Josh Coles. I'm from the Oxford Internet Institute. And I'm now going to hand over to my uh, colleague, uh, Professor Ralph Schroeder, also from the Institute, who's going to talk about some of these opportunities and challenges uh, to you in relation to web archiving. Thank you, Ralph. Thanks, John. So I'm Ralph. Um, <coughs> we'll have gotten the sense that future historians, future humanities scholars, and so on, will look back to the web and try to figure out what it was about us at this time and years past and how we can explore it. So this talk uh, will go quickly through kind of what is the web, because that's the uh, question. And then we'll get more into the nitty gritty of uh, what web archives are about. So it's very complicated to define. I mean, it's uh, 
25 years? It's about uh, 25 years it's been in existence, and you know we we still have to get to grips with it. I mean, it's growing very quickly, but I think uh, you could look at it in terms of different components. And uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Niels Brugger from Denmark, has uh, trying to do that by kind of looking at different bits of what the web is. So you could obviously look at different things that are part of the web page, or you could look at the page as a whole, or you could look at a website. In other words, BBC is a website, but it has many different parts, many different pages, and many different elements. Then there's something called, uh, so that's uh, web page, website. A web sphere is even more difficult to define. I mean, you could say, for example, that .co.uk, or just anything in the UK, is a web sphere, just like uh, .com could be a sphere, or different countries could be a sphere. So you could have whole collections of web pages that make up a whole kind of cluster of things that define a particular part of the web. And then you could look at the web as a whole. I mean, there are people who just say, what's out there? Internet archive, which is trying to archive the whole of the web or as much of it as they can grab, would be an example of the whole web. So, uh, well, that's the last one, which is the web. And uh, this shows the interrelation of those things. So you're going from uh, the bits all the way to the whole thing with various different uh, parts in between. So you can think of the web as being different strata. And for historians and others, the, the point is to kind of do an archaeology to get through all the different strata from top to bottom. So, uh, what are the challenges? Well, um, one thing is that the web changes rather quickly. <laughs> and not all of it is archived in the same way. And so, uh, you know, you, unlike a newspaper, let's say, which can also change, but I mean, you've got newspaper archives and you've got the physical bits of paper and they're pretty much all the same. The web is a constantly changing thing. It's got different formats. Um, and even though it's born digital, so we can grab it very easily and we can, we can put it together, it will consist of different versions. For example, the website will have different versions and that may be problematic to a historian or another person who's trying to figure out what archives are about and who are faced with different copies of the same thing. Is that the same thing? Am I seeing the same thing that somebody else might have seen? Um, and every uh, archive that you might make, so you might go over there and actually look at uh, what we've created in this UK archive, and you, you can look at it and you could see it as being something that you've reconstructed for your own purposes, but it will be your version, and maybe not somebody else's version. So it's almost always deficient, but then again, all archives are in some way uh, deficient. And so of course, newspapers may have been lost, or historical documents may have been incomplete, and so on. No archive is a direct representation of what it's supposed to represent, and, and the web is, is very much like that. Uh, so you're recreating uh, something, you're, you're, you're uh, putting together a series of documents in order to learn about what it is you're learning about, whether that's family history or in, uh, a particular aspect of the web, let's say the, the business pages that have been created in the UK for the last 20 or so years and so on. Um, so as with every bit of archive, the archive doesn't exist until you created it unless you put it together. And there are technical reasons why it might be different. And the constantly updated nature of the web is also something that you have to bear in mind when you look at archives. Thanks very much. Um, so let's drill down a little bit further and look at the UK web in, uh, in perspective. Um, so a bit of context on the UK's use of the internet. I mean, we were very early adopters, uh, enthusiastic early adopters of the internet. Uh, it helps that the, uh, the 
creator of the World Wide Web, it's uh, Tim Berners-Lee, it's British, so we have a, a sort of a, a real cultural icon there, somebody who's, who's really led the way in this area. And you can see that there's a chart on the right showing the number of, effectively the number of websites um, starting from 1997 uh, all the way through to 2010, and you can see the way they're just, you know, rapidly growing uh, over time. So the, this is within the .uk domain. Um, there's a weird drop there, and this is actually the data we collected in, um, in our web archive, and the, the drop you see there is perhaps evidence of one of the technical challenges of, of collecting. Uh, we haven't entirely been able to figure out why the data we have after 2009 is a bit less, and it certainly doesn't fit the trend, but the overall trend certainly shows an upward swing, uh, all, you know, constantly really over the last uh, 15 years. And certain parts about the UK web make it very interesting to study, not just because um, you know, we might be interested in, in what's on there, but you have a relatively unique structure really in how, in how the UK web is structured. I'm sure you'd be familiar with these terms, code.uk, gov.uk, ac.uk, or.uk. I'm sure you'll probably know what they, what they stand for. But actually the UK is, is fairly unique in having these kind of thematic second level domains as we call them. Um, sort of, so it means that when you look at uh, linked data, for example, look at how different websites uh, interact with each other between these different domains, um, you can get some really interesting patterns by knowing what, uh, what these addresses stand for. And that's uh, what we did. So in one of the, um, in a paper we, we produced last year based on uh, JISC data, which they'd um, gathered and obtained from the Internet Archive, um, we were able to look at uh, how these um, different subdomains, this is all within the UK, how these different subdomains, um, first what, what, uh, how, how, uh, what the makeup is in the overall domain, and then also how they interacted. So the chart on the left, uh, shows um, what you know, how much uh, each domain contributes to the overall size of the UK domain, and you can see the .co.uk does dominate. I don't know how big the writing is there, but uh, at least um, over time, at least 85% of the UK's domain is .co.uk throughout. So .co.uk is a massive domain, as you might expect. Um, there's a lot of companies, but also it's, it's used as a bit of a generic domain. If you're unsure what to set up, it will be a .co.uk domain on average. And but the interesting uh, bits are sort of further up. So the red strand is organizations, so charities. And you can see that they started with a relatively small um, piece of the pie, but they gradually got, got a bit bigger over time relative to the other uh, domains. What we can really see here in particular is the founding role that academia played in the early web. So early on, academia accounted for quite a lot, for, for 10% of the uh, number of nodes within the UK domain um, because obviously universities are at the forefront really of developing this technology. But that really does wither over time until virtually nil, unfortunately, uh, these days. And government as well played a, a less significant, but certainly a, a role as well. And you can see that reflected in the orange strand, which again thins down a bit uh, over time. And then on the right, you can see this um, kind of a network graph, I suppose. This looks at how different domains link to each other. And the way to understand this sort of uh, chart, I don't even know the name of this kind of chart, but um, is the color of the, the sort of the, the line, the strand, relates to the links going out. So the big green um, .co um, strand going to .org is the biggest relationship. So we know that we found that .co addresses like to link a lot to .org addresses, and .org addresses like to link back uh, quite a lot to the code domain. Uh, and there's all the interesting smaller relationships there. Um, academia links uh, a lot to, uh, to .co and to .org. Um, but uh, but doesn't get so many back. So it's, it's, uh, academics are a bit upset about that. But it's been a, it's been a really interesting exercise to look through how these different um, subdomains talk to each other within the wider UK domain. But let's just have a, spend a couple of minutes thinking about using web archives in general. Now, if, I bet if you've used a web archive before, it may well have been uh, the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine. And that's a fan fascinating and fantastic technology. Uh, it's been around for a long time, always as long as the web itself. I think 1996 it started. And it's been archiving ever since, and it's an invaluable resource. And all the research we're doing in this project is based off uh, data which has come from, uh, ultimately, from the Internet Archive. Um, but there's slight differences between how the web actually works and how the UK archive, the web archive search interface that we've been developing uh, works. So with the Wayback Machine, you've got to know the address. You've got to know what you want to find. So I want to see what BBC.co.uk looked at on a particular day. Uh, so you have to enter the address in, in the top there and then browse through the dates. But with us, uh, with our uh, search interface, which we've been developing uh, in concert with the British Library and the Institute for Historical Research here, uh, we've been looking at how uh, we can search thematically through keywords um, to find things that you don't know where they are, you just want to find them, which in some ways is a bit more similar to what we're used to through something like Google. So it's more reflective in a way, I think, of the sort of overall uh, web, web experience. And that is a tool which we're going to be hopefully um, trying out in, in a few minutes' time. 
Um, we also have more advanced search tools in this interface, which we'll be able to test. Um, so we can search um, particular terms, but you can also search whether particular terms refer together. Um, so if you wanted to assess um, opinions towards Manchester United, you could search Manchester United and good slash rubbish within three words of the phrase itself. So it's really interesting tools, ways of getting into the archive and, and figuring out what's there and really finding exactly what it is uh, you want to find. You can also search within date ranges, although that's the date it was collected in the archive because we don't actually have data when, of when something went online, and only when we took it from the internet. And you can search on the basis of URLs, formats, uh, the title of a web page, and, and things like that as well. Um, so the way I would sort of sum this up is that it allows you to search not just for um, a particular Pizza Express restaurant, but it allows you to search for pizza, which is a bit more similar to, what, in many cases, what researchers want to find. And on that note, as part of this project, uh, the Big UK Domain Data for the Arts and Humanities, uh, we have been uh, inviting 11 uh, expert academic researchers to dig into this, although researchers who don't have any prior experience of using web archives, to dig into this interface, to play with it, to break it, to, uh, and, and ultimately to dig out what they can find. They're each uh, yeah, they're humanities researchers, so they have uh, a wide array of different interests. You can see some of them there. Um, all doing lots of uh, really, really interesting stuff, which they hope to be reporting back on um, fairly soon. And there's the other uh, group, uh, other set there, um, but a, a really wide array of, um, of fascinating humanities questions, which we hope can be answered in quite a unique way uh, through the use of these web archives. So, what I would end on is just by saying it's not just for academics. Please do come and find out more for yourself. We're just across the hall. You may have already seen us. We've got, I think, five computer terminals set up there. Uh, and you can come along and uh, dig into the archive, find out who the web thinks you are, whether you have, uh, whether you just want to search your name or search for different search tools to find out more and search, your, um, search yourself across time and see how you're represented within the web. Because ultimately, this is a great resource for academics and it's a great way of answering broad social questions like our researchers are doing. But it's also a way, I think, in some ways, to, to really take control of the information that's out there about you. Knowing, what, uh, knowing how you're represented on the web is the first step towards um, getting, taking, you know, greater control. There's, there's lots of legal um, fights going on right now about things like the right to be forgotten uh, in the European court, and these things are really coming to the fore right now because I think people do care about there being too much information about them uh, in the world uh, and on the web. And I think this project ultimately is the first step towards um, resting, resting some control back and really learning um, how it is that we are represented online. So please do check it out. It's open until four o'clock in the hall across across the hallway and the room across the hallway. And uh, thank you very much for your time.